Bapak William Tanuwijaya. Thank you, Pak William. Last but not least, uh, our speaker, handsome doctor from Harvard, <laughs> from Thailand, uh, Mr. San Santitan Satitarai. Let's come from Santi. All right. Thank you guys for, for coming here uh, for, for uh, such a notice, actually, less than a month. <laughs> so, so thank you so much for coming here um, today. So let me begin with the CV uh, to, to introduce you guys. I will start with, with, with Damien. So if you don't mind, I will call you by first name, if it's OK with you. OK. Uh, Damien. Damien is the Deputy Chief FinTech Officer and currently heads the FinTech Infrastructure Office as well as the FinTech Ecosystem Office at the Monetary Authority of Singapore. As you may well know, Singapore is one of the uh, advanced country in terms of digital response, right? So uh, we, we are lucky to have uh, the MS is here, and MS uh, play a very crucial role in this uh, transformation. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll talk a little bit on how Singapore sees those, 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 those transformation. Uh, the second one, uh, Debo. Debo is from city Singapore. Uh, actually, not only Singapore, but ASEAN. Uh, it's the head, uh, head of city's treasury and trade solution uh, business in Singapore and ASEAN. Uh, pa Arman, of course, from Russia. Uh, he's a vice president of the, one of the biggest bank in Indonesia, one of the most uh, advanced in, in terms of technology. Thank you for coming, Pak Arman. And then, uh, of course, Pak William. Uh, Pak William is the CEO of, of the Tokopedia, one of the uh, most popular uh, e-commerce in, in the country. And again, last but not least, Santi. Santi worked for the uh, C Group, uh, so one of the uh, business of C Group is Sophia in, in Singapore. So today, we, we are so lucky, so lucky to have those uh, five speakers here. Let me begin with you, Damien. How Singapore really see this transformation? Uh, are you really afraid or are you really excited? And, and, and how then uh, you, you do the response? How you see the, uh, the, the, the uh, striking the right balance? And then how, how then you create? Singapore is uh, very famous with this uh, API playbook. It's really nice. So one of, one of the initiatives also from MS, if I'm not mistaken. So probably you can talk about it a little bit and, and how then uh, MS really push forward the digital transformation in the financial sector. Sure, thank Please, you, Damien. Uh, thank you, Owen. Um, good morning, uh, Governor Perry, uh, distinguished guests. Definitely very happy, very delighted to be among you to talk about digital transformation and um, very much at the core of what we are doing at the MAS uh, is about, as what Governor Perry mentioned earlier, we strongly recognize the important role of innovation in our next phase of economy as well as society development. And but of course, coupled together with that is definitely about the risk. I mean, we are in the central bank, we are a financial regulator. It must be in our blood itself to be aware very much with regards to risk. And when this topic was, was given to me, I was thinking about it and it so happens uh, on Thursday, just just Thursday, um, having come back from a working trip in uh, China itself, uh, I was with a group of entrepreneurs in the blockchain space. And the day they were sharing with me the day before, the few of them were celebrating Pizza Day. No, really, really, they were celebrating Pizza Day. Now that's because on Wednesday itself, nine years ago, um, Bitcoin was being used to finally fulfill a particular purpose, which was what it has initially intended for, which is about payments. So when we talk about payments that has been gone through thousands of years of uh, 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 evolution, nine years ago, Bitcoin, something of a ground-up innovation, uh, was being used for the first time. In Florida, someone was using Bitcoins, 10,000 no, 10, Bitcoins, in fact, to pay for two pizzas. And that was about $30 US dollar back then. So as the enthusiasts were celebrating Pizza Day, commemorating the anniversary of the first use of a, a Bitcoin for payments purposes, I kind of don't think the, the person that made the payments of 10,000 Bitcoins for two pizzas is celebrating. 
we're talking about 60 to 80 million. Mm -hmm. We're talking about US dollars that's worth right now. So, but it, it epitomizes, it demonstrates, indicates how technology innovations is coming through with regards to uh, our very uh, forms of what we do in the financial services space. So today, I will talk about a key, a key topic about uh, as we recognize this growing part about innovation is about how we manage those risks very much uh, from the central bank's perspective as a regulator. So moving to the first slide, I think I, I applaud uh, Governor Perry's point about, uh, could, could we move to the first slide? Can we have the yeah, slide? Yeah, yes, okay. Oh, yes. Yeah, there's a clicker over yeah. there. So I applaud uh, uh, Governor Perry's uh, point about digital economy and the important role at which central bank can play. I think increasingly central bank has to break out of uh, where it's comfort areas around looking at macroeconomics, looking at macro prudential tools, uh, looking to monetary policies, um, putting in place robust uh, real-time payment systems itself. Going beyond that, recognizing that it has an important role, in fact, leadership role, in terms of how we transform the economy. How we transform the economy into one that's much more digital, or what we call the digital economy. And if you look at it, it gels very well with what we have been or want to do with regards to digital financial services, digitalizing financial services. When we talk about digitalizing financial services, it cannot be for the sake of digitalizing that financial service on its own. We cannot be just digitalizing payment services, digitalizing uh, forms of uh, onboarding at which our customers are being used to, uh, otherwise they have to appear in some branch itself. But very much, financial services is part and parcel of the economic activities in the society itself. So which is central bank playing a key part in working with the industry, working with relevant government agencies itself, and often taking on a key leadership role in pulling together developments, be it in infrastructure, putting in place regulations, and working with the industry, be it on talents, as well as better understanding of the different kind of technologies that will play a part in transforming our economy. At the end of the day, uh, it is about the use of innovation that helps our consumers' lives to be much better. But of course, it brings about the additional benefits to the financial industry in terms of uh, managing risk, mm -hmm. of course, mm -hmm. um, creating new economic opportunities. But very much underpinning it all is about better lives for consumers and businesses. So at the MAS itself... You can point it out to the, you can point it out to the monitor there. Oh. Okay. Uh -huh. So at the... Okay, this is where technology doesn't seem to work very well. Uh, yeah, but it is part and parcel of it. It is also about managing risk. So I'm pretty certain there's someone that's clicking it right now in case this one doesn't work. So in the MES itself, we very much recognize that we need to play a part in, uh, in establishing Singapore as a, uh, uh, for its digital economy. And we have recognized that there are 10 key enablers uh, and, but they broadly comprise of three particular groups of, uh, of enablers. Firstly, uh, it's about trust. I think if you look at financial services, it's very much about um, trust. If you do not have consumers who trust the financial services, the financial institutions are doing their part with protecting your money, you're not going to put your money in some bank. If the bank doesn't give you that confidence. But in the digital realm itself, there's a, unfortunate, there's a need for a much more an, an intensive way of putting together and bringing about confidence and trust by consumers and the businesses. So at the first layer, we talk about trust. And that is a very much a key role where governments, including the central bank, will have to play a part. And of course, the next angle, next area, we call it the tech area. Noting that there are a range of technologies, do we understand those different technologies well enough? Do we have enough guidance to help our financial industry to be able, to, as well as broader industry itself, to adopt those technologies? So we're talking about guidance and co-creation with the industry. But last but not least, as a group of 
enablers. We are talking about talents. Uh, sorry, Damon, before you go to the talent, yes. could you talk a little bit more about the API? Do you oh, do the sure. standardization Fantastic. of API? Pa pa Governor yes. already mentioned about the, the importance of API and the standardization of mm. API so can then can boost the, the collaboration between bank and fintech. Yes. So if you look at the, in fact, the API area is one of a very interesting area. For the longest of time, our finance industry has been working on very siloed based technology stacks. And that is where if you ask a business unit within a bank itself to put in place a new product, easily we are talking about 18 months to 24 months kind of time frame to do something, putting in place those new product areas, new services. But APIs is changing the very much the story of how financial institutions will be able to work with uh, players, the fintech players, which are much more agile and much more ideal with innovation at the top of their minds, how to provide good solutions and in particular, good customer experience to be able to allow financial institutions to leverage on such mm -hmm. technology. But of course, the way in which you enable fintechs as well as financial institutions to work together, it is through APIs. And that is why uh, in two years ago, MES worked together with the financial industry to develop this, uh, we have mentioned earlier about this finance as a service API playbook. Two years ago. Yes, two years ago. And that is only one of the key things that we have, we have been doing. So basically, API playbook is standardization of API, so industry can use those standardized API. So it, it is about what type of APIs, of course, at banks, should invest in to develop. And when you want to manage APIs to instill trust in the broader consumers, you've got to have a whole life cycle management, including cybersecurity areas. We are talking about financial services that needs to be trusted by consumers if they are to be adopted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if consumers do not trust digital financial services, it's set to fail from day one. Right. Yep. Okay. So I was talking about the, so the last, oh, no, problem, no problem. we want to keep this as an informal, <laughs> I think uh, yes, Governor Perry was mentioning this about this as well. Uh, it is about sharing of, of how we have done in the different jurisdictions and we learn from each other. And one of the key things about talents, talents is about the knowledge, understanding, which is where we joined the different conferences, for example, as this event hosted by BI, uh, as well as the ability to work together in the industry to experiment on new technology. One of the key bugbears about technology is that if you do not understand it, you tend to fear it. And when you tend to fear it, you tend not to have regulations and policies that allow the effective adoption of those technology by the industry. So we need to cross over that particular hurdle that's very much not just about the industry, mm. but also at the central bank. Because we also do not understand the technology that well as well. But the way to go about doing it is we collaborate with the industry. We collaborate with fellow regulators. And together, we work on experiments. Project Ubin in the area of blockchain, one of the key technologies, is going to transform the fundamental way in which financial services will be delivered. But do we understand it well enough? Well, the only way to do that is we work together, we experiment in actual use cases, and we understand that when it comes to real production situations, we are ready with the kind of regulations that support it in a safe and sound manner. So that is very much central bank's role in the digital economy. Yes. Okay, thank, thank you so much, Damien. Let me now move on to Santi. Uh, Santi, uh, you have the clicker here. You have the microphone over there? Yep. All right. Santi, before goes to the C Group, he was the chief economist in, in Credit Suisse, his responsibility is Asia Pacific. And then suddenly he decided to go to the FinTech. So it's quite interestingly. But basically, he's a chief economist. So let me ask him how an economist see this disruption. And in, in that story, how then it fit in to your story where you move from these uh, big players like Credit Suisse to, 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 to the C Group. Please, Santi. Thank, thank you very much. Um, first, I'd like to thank you, uh, Pat Perry, for this inspiring speech. Of course, I've listened to your speech many times before, but in a previous life, mostly about monetary policy. So uh, this is the new direction that I, uh, new new materials I've heard, which is great. Um, and, and and thank you very much for introduction. Uh, I think you know, as as to say, I think as one of the topic that I 
want to talk about today and share with you today is part of the reasons why I moved uh, from my previous job to the current job. Because uh, I truly believe that there is um, opportunity that, you know, when we talk about digital disruption, we tend to think about something happen externally and something more of a threat. But there is also um, an opportunity. And the word which I put in um, the screen just now was actually the word discovery, that you can actually discover new opportunity. Um, but part, partly to do that, you really need to make sure that the digital transformation is inclusive. It works for everybody and not just for a few. And that's why this is the main topic of, of today that I want to um, talk about a little bit. But um, before getting into how to do inclusive digital transformation. Uh, can, you can point it to the sure. monitor over there. Oh, it's not working. Sorry about that. Um, Somebody can help us, please. OK. Can we skip to second slide, actually? Yes. Second slide. Please. Second slide. Uh, you have to do a few more clicks. Yes, <laughs> few animation. Yep. Uh, this is one, please. Um, so this is the one framework I really like, um, which helped link the um, e-commerce to digital payments. It helped remind us that there are two sides of the coins when we talk about uh, digital payments. There's a supply side, which is about facilitation, about reducing the cost of adopting e-payments. And this is something very important. I think you know, Bank Indonesia have done some very important work on this front, whether it's infrastructure, standardization, regulations, and of course, with the launch of QRIS today. Um, but there's also another side of the coin, which is very, very important for digital payments, and that's the demand side. Um, remember, payments, it's not really an end in itself. It's a means to an end. We don't like to pay for stuff, actually. We just want the stuff. We want the goods. We want the services. And payment is something we have to do to get that, right? Um, and so the stronger, the more powerful the use cases of digital payments, the more likely that we are people going to adopt the digital payments as a tool. So if you look around the world, you have seen many powerful use cases of things like e-commerce, um, games, ride hailing. And of course, in Indonesia, I've heard that we're trying to uh, um, add in some powerful use cases like the toll roads becoming cashless as well, which is very important. But these are very, very important ways to drive the economy. So when you want a strong, powerful drive for digital payments and digital financial services, when you have both the demand side and supply side coming together. So you need to work on both fronts. And I think this demand side does you know, bring us to the next part of how do we attain um, the digital transformation for the general economy that would drive the demand for digital payments. So that's a key question I want to talk a little bit about today. And there's, um, if you can skip to uh, the next next slide, please. <laughs> um, the, key, the key point is that there's no one correct answer. Um, we have to really tailor, uh, next slide, please. We have to really tailor this to different the users group. So I just want to take, give us a few examples. So when Shopee started back in 2015, um, there was a change in e-commerce space from a PC-based e-commerce to a more mobile-based e-commerce. In fact, another movement was on the rise, and it's called social commerce. Social commerce is when you transact doing buy and sell transaction through social media platform. And all of that was a good business, and it was booming. There's a lot of entrepreneurs coming to the marketplace. It's still a clunky process. So to do actually complete one transaction, you have to browse through one platform, chat to another platform, make payments through bank apps or um, uh, websites, and then track your product orders to another logistic. So you take about four or five apps just to complete one transaction. So at a time, Shopee question we ask ourselves, can we make this easier? Can we put everything into just one platform on mobile and still contain, retain all the features that make social commerce um, attractive, like live chat um, with the merchants to keep things flexible, negotiating, chatting. At the same time, we integrate the logistic and payments uh, into one app, which are the two key pain points. And if you can skip to the next slide, one of the issues that we're trying to solve was the trust problem. So that was an absolutely critical problem in payment space, especially for marketplace e-commerce, is the lack of trust between the buyers and the sellers. So the system we came up with, uh, one of them was the Shopee guarantee system, where um, the buyers will first pay to Shopee as a holding account, and then 
the money will only be released to the sellers after the buyers have received the goods and confirmed the order that they have received it. And so by acting as intermediary, Shopee has partly reduced the problem of trust that exists between the merchant and the sellers. And as we move on, and we have more and more sellers come into the ecosystem, we found that, okay, these solutions are great and it works for digital entrepreneurs. But what about the SME, the brick and mortar SME, the traditional SMEs that represent about 99% of enterprises in Indonesia? For this group, it requires a totally different approach. So if you could skip uh, next slide and go to next one. Uh, next one, please. Um, for this group, we did a study and we found that, in fact, almost 90% of them find digital commerce to be opportunity, something that can help their business. But astonishing low percentage, less than 30%, actually adopted e-commerce in a serious way. And upon looking more closely into that, we found that the key binding constraint was education, digital literacy. And you can't just come up with cool big data analytics and digital tools and expect them to come and learn it and pick it up themselves. You need to bring technology to them. And that's exactly what we did. That's why we launched the campus um, Shopee or Shopee University, which is a series of workshops that we conduct offline in different cities, not just in tier one, but all over the countries, in order to teach them from basic um, how to take photos, how to label your products, all the way to advanced digital tools, how, to, um, re how much inventory should you hold, how do you price your products, how do you marketing um, a campaign effectively, all those things. And so far we have worked with over 40,000 entrepreneurs. More than half of that are female. It's about female empowerment as well as uh, um, uh, uh, empowering entrepreneurs. So um, more female than male then? More female than male in, in, in our groups. Um, and partly I think it's also because it's a marketplace model and there's a lot of uh, products like uh, fashion, beauty, crafts. Um, so there's a lot of, actually there's a lot of housewives as well who discover new business opportunity um, by trying out on e-commerce first and become a full-fledged business afterwards. Um, and we're spanning over 40 cities and still working on that. Um, and the latest uh, uh, place was actually in Sorong in West Papua Sorong. where we did our, our session. Um, and through that experience has been a great learning experience for us because we came across many hidden gems of entrepreneur. Um, on the next slide, um, I want to talk about one case in particular which I really like, which case of Ibu um, Vina, who's a seller of eyelashes in Bali, actually. And so she's, um, she's a seller of eyelashes, she and her husband um, doing business together. But they were struggling because rents were expensive. And going from salon to salon to sell eyelashes, it's just very, very tough for them. So they could only sell about 100 pairs a month, and they were actually on the verge of bankruptcy. But then she found e-commerce, and she learned all the techniques, all the tools that e-commerce can give her. And after that, she found that actually the business is no longer bounded by geography. It's no longer bounded by how, by how many salespeople she can employ. And her sales exploded. It went from 100 to 10,000 a month. Become from a two people business, now she employ over 50 people. Five zero. F five zero, yes. Wow. And most of them are more to relate to production because she doesn't need that much help on the sales side. And that's the kind of productivity boost, employment boost we can see. And she's not the only case. On the next slide, you'll see that as we grow, um, that's choppy users in 2015 heat map. That's after one year, so in 2016, it's all over the country. And I think that's the beauty of e-commerce. You can be anywhere, not just a big tier, you know, top tier cities. You can ring, really bring and create a new dimension of connectivity and bringing under merchants and sellers together. Um, so, um, but then we also realized that actually it's not just SME that need digital transformation. Big firms, brands, they also need it. And so we have to come up with solutions for them as well. And that's on the next slide, where we launched Choppy Mall, now working with over uh, 1,000 brands uh, in Indonesia. But because the solution they require is very different, 
Um, there is but less hand-holding. They usually have already digitalized some of the system. They already have their digital back end. So the key thing that they need is they, want, they don't want to relearn everything, so they need to link the system to us. So we have the open API system where they can link that digital back end to our system so they don't have to start everything. We have things like the brand portals to allow them to, um, who sell from multiple channels, multiple stores, to manage everything in one place. Um, and last but not least, um, of course, we've been talking mainly about merchants, about entrepreneurs. But there's another side very, very important of the business market, which is the consumer, the buyer themselves. And that's going to be my, my last message. Uh, so we are also seeing another very interesting movement in e-commerce. Um, we talked about mobile commerce, social commerce. But I think the next phase of commerce that we are seeing, um, if you can click one up here, it's called experiential e-commerce. And that sounds like a fancy term, but what it really means is that people now don't go to e-commerce just to buy one thing that they want. They don't, it, it doesn't work in a way where I want a jeans, I go to e-commerce, I search for what jeans I buy and get out. They go there for experience, just like people go to malls. They like to window shopping. They like to discover what they want. They want to spend time there. So how do we do that on a mobile, something so small? Well. The, the, the solution we came up with was that instead of window shopping in a mall, you have to go and walk around and see different goods. We bring all the stores to walk to you. So you can do window shopping without walking, which is kind of nice and also dangerous, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> um, um, so we personalize, we use a, a machine learning algorithm to customize what they see, so they see the daily discovered kind of product they might be interested in. Also important, we also curated the, the deals, the discount deals that might be relevant to them. And this is especially important for the low-income household who need to buy necessity baby products, diapers. This is sort of close to my heart because I, I have two young kids. Um, so that's you know, something very, very important. I can save the budget as well. Um, so. That brings me to the very last slide, which is that you know, I think inclusive digital transformation, once you look through it, it's not just about technology. It's about putting customer at the center. I think Pat Perry also spoke about this, that customer must be at the center of everything. And about understanding their needs, whether they're social sellers, brands, SMEs, or buyers. And adjusting the solution, both digital and offline, to cater to their demand. And that's a demand-driven inclusive digital transformation, which I think could ultimately lead to greater adoption of digital payments as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Santi. So um, digital transformation is, is real, right? So it changed the customer experience, changed the business model, and, and so on and so forth. So that's why you moved there. <laughs> Absolutely. So that's let's a long move, answer. So let's move to, to Debo. Uh, but before we move, if you would like to ask the question digitally, you have a, a piece of paper here. Uh, just scan there, and then you can ask question using your mobile. We, we would like you to experience the digitalization of a seminar, right? So you, you have a, this, when you do the registration, you have this piece of paper, uh, or, or go to this um, um, website over there. Let's move to today, Bo. Um, some, somebody said, about 20 years ago, banking is important, but probably bank is not. It, it's 20 years ago. And you know who said that? Bill Gates. He's not a banker. Bill Gates said so, and it's almost 20 years ago. Now it's really happening, right? You see Alibaba, you see even Amazon, they, they really have the banking in, in their platform. So the future banking probably will be different from the one we, we see today. So then how, how then Citibank fits in to, to, the, to the story? We, we learned that Citibank, Citibank decided that you, you will do this digital transformation some years ago. What really was the motivation at that time and, and how far uh, you went so far? Please, Debo. Well, thank you very much, Erwin. Uh, Salamat pagi, uh, Governor Perry, and to all the distinguished guests and my fellow panelists. Uh, delighted to be here. Um, I think from a Citibank perspective, we really see this as a tremendous opportunity, which was one of my favorite words that came up on the screen in the word cloud. Um, I think this is an unprecedented opportunity for us to partner and collaborate 
to really bring about inclusive digital transformation. Um, and we don't believe that only one part of the financial services community will deliver this. We think it will be a joint effort. Um, I'd like to just touch upon a few aspects which will sort of bring home, uh, bring this home. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip some slides. Uh, if you could just move on to the next slide. Um, what, just one aspect on this, and we spoke about industrial revolutions. We really believe that we are now in the middle of the fourth industrial revolution. And to me, what is unique about this is not that it is there's digital transformation going on, but that there's a convergence between the digital, the physical, and the biological. An immortal, artificially designed thinking human being is not that far away, as indeed a 3D printed liver transfer is not, a transplant is not that far away. So it's important to understand the context that there's transformation happening in all three spheres of our lives, the digital, the physical, and the biological. And what does that mean for the future of uh, commerce? If you can skip again. This is a very important slide which I wanted to just touch upon to bring home to this audience as a reminder that it's not only disruption, but it's also the immense speed of disruption that has changed. It took 75 years for the landline to reach 100 million users. It took 170 days for the last telecom and content provider in India to reach 100 million users. And what's of special source of interest to me is that the last two names on this chart are both from Asia. And I think that brings us to the next slide, which is that Asia is really at the center of this digital disruption. Whether you think about the fact that Asia is a trillion dollar e-commerce economy growing at 25% per annum, which is faster than any other region. The only close region that comes remotely close is Latin America at 19%, and they are, a very, very, they are working off a very, very small base. And I think the other interesting aspect of this is that while half of Asia is unbanked, almost there's 80 to 90% penetration in mobile phones and about 60 to 70% penetration in smartphone, which you, know, you referred to in your example of mobile first. If you can move on. To the next, next slide, slide please. please. Apologies. Uh, we, I'll skip to the next slide. Next slide. Yes. This is another very interesting trend that a lot of you will appreciate here, is that Asia has the largest number of unbanked in percentage terms, but is also, as the center of commerce, our expectation is as the e-commerce market grows from a trillion to three trillion, 80% of consumer to business flows will be driven through digital payments. Partly through wallets, which of course is being led by Asia, but also partly through the third block there, which is the fastest growing block, which is bank transfers, which I think is really going to be fundamental to this, which is instant payments. And I think that's going to drive how payments, banking, is going to converge with fintech mm -hmm. and e-commerce. If you could just move on to the next slide, please. Before I close this section, I think this is something I really wanted to share with the audience, which, which I really believe. Uh, this is a page by McKinsey. And their research shows that by 2025, industries will largely converge into 12 large ecosystems. And about 30% of global GDP is going to flow through these ecosystems. Now, there are a couple of interesting things to note here is that one, you move away from industries into ecosystems. But if you see the bottom, the three on the bottom half, if you add them all up, they're almost 50% of the total number on this page. And they're all business to business or business to consumer commerce. And the reason I wanted to call that out is that as we develop a new, a new regulatory framework for the world of digital banking and digital commerce, we need to keep in mind that a lot of manual non-digital commerce today happens between businesses and between consumers and businesses. And we need to make sure that that is equally digitized as is retail payments. Otherwise, the world of banking will be left behind in innovation. 
What is that leading to in terms of, and where do banks like us come in? Uh, next slide, please. What that's leading to is the world of open banking and digital banking. This chart here shows the steps that regulators around the world are, are driving digital banking and are driving financial inclusion. If you look at all of the examples, Europe has gone the way of open API and open banking. In Asia too, Singapore has led the way by announcing standards and encouraging the industry to adapt those best practices. We are seeing development of that in Indonesia as well. And many of the other Asian markets are developing real-time payment networks that encourage the advent of APIs and digital banking and encourage a level playing field for fintechs and banking. And these are the principles on which they are driving this. Yes, uh, Governor Perry spoke about innovation should happen, but in the context of a larger regulatory framework so that you can ensure that consumers are protected. You can ensure that monetary policy is uh, is taken care of and fraud risk and know your customer risk and cyber risks are taken care of. Uh, if I can move on to the next slide. Next, please. I want to touch upon this in the context of financial inclusion. Uh, you talked about cities, uh, you know, uh, relevance. I think as, as a bank that exists today in networks in about 100 countries, we plug into clearing uh, about 245 clearing systems. Uh, and given that we were such a large part of a country's economic development, we, we worked with Imperial College eight years ago to develop uh, a digital index, which is independently researched and developed by Imperial College of the UK. And they basically measure the readiness of 80 countries around the world around four uh, key pillars, what we consider to be four key pillars. And you can see them there. Their government support, financial technology infrastructure, the presence of digital money solutions in and out of banking, as well as the propensity to adopt. And we have been measuring this for the last eight years. And why are we such big believers in this and why are we pushing this index? The figures that you can see in digital money benefits, we believe that even a 10% movement of this index brings in 220 million consumers into the formal banking and formal digital money ecosystems. And that through increased benefits and through access to greater credit and greater credit and savings leads to an increase in the economies themselves. So we are, a, we are a very firm believer in the digital index. And what we have seen in the last eight years that we have been tracking this, all of the countries have moved up, as you can see, right, in, in, uh, uh, till 2018. Uh, and this, again, is, is a good yardstick to measure where each of us stands as we develop our markets. If I can just quickly move on. Uh, Debo, uh, yes, uh, I have uh, one question, one sure. specification. How sure. does the city see the, the idea of, of open banking? You know, it's not easy for a bank to, to adopt uh, such a, a new uh, idea, right? Bank have a core banking system, which is basically not easy to, to, to change, right? Some people even said it's, it's much easier to have new bank instead of to transform an old bank into a digital bank. So how you do this, and, and how, how you see this, um, this um, idea of, of open banking? Because in the UK, for example, some big banks have an objection to, to, to the idea. How, how, how does Citibank see the, the idea of open, open banking? I think it's a great question. And we know that there are banks who are experimenting or have experimented by setting up a completely new digital bank. Um, I, I think the way we look at it from a city, as like I said, we are in 100 countries. Yes, we do have a lot of legacy uh, platforms. But for us, we look at ourselves as in the future, going by our belief in the concept of ecosystems, we, in the future we look at ourselves as a financial ecosystem and a financial platform. And our vision is that when you as a consumer or a customer or a corporate or an SME uh, come onto our platform, you should be able to access a wide array of financial products and services, some which we will deliver ourselves, and some which we will deliver through partnerships with others. So we, don't, we are not really building ourselves as a monolithical bank as the future. We are looking to transform ourselves into an ecosystem 
of financial products. Nice. Let's move to, to Armand. BCI is one of the uh, biggest banks in Indonesia and really advanced in terms of digitalization. You, you have um, a digital bank some years ago. So I, I, I should repeat my, my, my question to you as I asked uh, Debo uh, just now. How you really do the transformation? I know it's really, really hard to, to change the core banking system into a digital system. And, and, and you do it quite nicely for, for such a big bank like, like, like BCA, and how you do that. And please also in your, story, in your story, if you can put some ingredient on the API in the process of, of digitalization. Please, Armand. Uh, first, um, let me make it clear, by the way. I, I don't think we're a big bank. Oh, you are. <laughs> <laughs> the only time I feel like a big bank, if I speak in other country. Because whenever I have a session like this in other country, the, the, one of the first question is, as a central bank, what is your policy? No, 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 no. <laughs> why, why, why? What, what was okay. the question again? You're bank central Asia, you're the central bank of Asia. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> At least. <laughs> Good point. Good point. Sorry, sorry. Bank Central Asia is much bigger than Bank Indonesia. <laughs> That's the only time I feel, hmm, uh, pretty big. <laughs> no, uh, I think we're, we're quite significant and systemic here in Indonesia, but look, there are other bigger banks, like Mandiri, BRI, the, uh, BNI, they're all big banks. Um, and we work together, actually, for a different ecosystem. I'm saying the word again, ecosystem. Nobody can do everything. Mm -hmm. um, Compared to other banks in, in other countries, in India and China, we're just one branch. Yeah, there's nothing, nothing much. There's still a lot of opportunity in Indonesia, which means that we have opportunity to grow. It's, it's I'm being optimistic. Um, now, coming back to going digital, uh, is it difficult or is it easy? It doesn't matter. We have to do it. I see. It, it's Another something good point. that we have to do. Another good point after the central bank things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> that's the only time I would. Sometimes they ask me, "Are you from Kazakhstan or from India? You're cent Central Asian?" No, no, no. <laughs> it's okay. That's another topic. Uh, now coming back to BC, how how are we managed to transform? Uh, it's not something that we really think about. It's something being forced upon. So I will explain a bit about our history. In 1990, we had a a mini monetary crisis in 1990. And it was tight liquidity. And if we couldn't get any liquidity in the market in 1990. Uh, those, I think, and some of the people in this room still remember Indonesia. Those who are still remember, I'm just trying to remind your age, you're not young anymore. <laughs> uh, thank you for that. <laughs> so do I, I still remember. Um, so we were forced to find liquidity by asking customers. Just ask the clients, customer at the center, what do you need? Payment is a pain. It was difficult to do payment. It, would, it took three days to five days to remit money. And the fee was pretty high. I'm talking about high fee, it was like this. 100 rupiah to 200 rupiah was enough for a meal at that time. And remittance what about, was about 500. Rupiah at that time, okay, uh, I used to have only 200 rupiah in my pocket, and that was enough for the whole day. Uh, and then the other one was, what do we do? They need better, cheaper, faster transaction. So we said, why not try online banking? We did it. We were successful, but we had problems. People were lining, were lining up to BCA. So we had long lines every day. It's the stuff you see in zombie movies. If you see zombie movies, you see all those people trying to, they're, they're, they're in this huge masses. That's what happens in our branches because there was no digital stuff. We didn't understand digital. Then we realized we need to use technology a bit more. So what technology does is it makes things easier. Suppose I take my phone. Ah. Oh, there's William here. I, I like to do a selfie here. 
I'm a photographer. 30 years ago, for me to do a selfie, I need to set up a tripod. And I need to set up my manual camera for another 15 minutes and pray it will be OK. Today, anybody can do it. So this year, I've been teaching my kids how to program. I remember it took me a, a good two hours to make my first basic program and a good few weeks to make assembly program. I was a programmer. For my kids, it took them five minutes to first to make their first program using Scratch. It took them an hour to make Flappy Bird app with wow. the Scratch. That's what technology does. And that's what happened to BCA. We, we are not a visionary bank. We actually react to customer needs. We just listen to customers. They're my customers, by the way. Um, 10 years ago, when, when all these e-commerce companies start to come out, they were talking about, uh, it's really difficult to connect. It's really difficult to reconcile. It's really long to actually do to settle payments. OK. And we need to make a better connection. And that became the API. Um, instead of using slides, uh, I have a simple video that demonstrates what right. BCA was and then what's BCA now. Uh, can you have my video on uh, the camera video. connect, okay. camera online? Okay, uh, it's, it's really a pain. Oh, not this one, the other one. The other one first, the other one. Uh, this is the English version. Uh, this is the API, but uh, there's only one, there's two. It's okay, use this one. Kita punya masalah di bagian rekonsiliasi ya gitu. Karena kita bekerja sama dengan partner lain yang dimana itu membutuhkan waktu. Jadi setiap transaksi itu harus kita cek secara satu persatu. Biasanya sih sebelumnya kan kita masih lumayan manual ya. E, itu digunakan buat proses rekonsiliasi bank. Biasanya kita bakalan e, visit ke website banknya. Kemudian kita bakal download untuk mutasinya. Dan kita akan cocokkan satu-satu nih ke masing-masing transaksi yang kita udah catat. Nah biasanya itu bakal akan waktu beberapa hari. Semakin banyak transaksi kalau zaman dulu semuanya waktu kita di awal itu benar sangat manual. Jadi kayak setiap jam 6 lihat Excel, terus uh, nyocokin, ngepecah jadi berbagai jenis invoice dikirim ke customer. Semenjak dibukanya API BCA bekerja sama dengan sistem kita, semua menjadi otomatis. Artinya kita bisa berjualan 24 jam, 7 hari seminggu. Definitely for, for me, BCA API is an enabler to our business, right? Suddenly everything can be automated, right? Right. The, the process is much more simplified. Uh, our customer service team can handle the cust more customers at one time compared to previously as well. Dan kalau misalnya dengan adanya API ini, uh, kita bisa dapat mutasinya itu secara otomatis setiap hari. Jadi kita nggak perlu lagi tuh nungguin uh, manager atau owner kita untuk menarikkan secara manual. Nah, kalau dengan adanya proses API yang otomatis ini, kita bisa tiap hari dapetin dan nggak nggak ada informasi yang kelewat lagi. Teknologi dinamis dan efisien. Uh, memberi nilai lebih dengan teknologi. Cepat, murah, dan keren. Dia teknologi inovatif, real time. Comprehensive, simple, and fast. Nice. Yeah. So uh, let me ask you this question because for, for some banks that when, when they have an objection uh, on the idea of, of open banking, there's a basic question like, what is in it for me, right, for, for, for the bank? Bank have all this data. When, when you open up your data, somebody else will get the benefit, for example, FinTech. But what really is the benefit of, of the bank? What is in it for, for BCI when, when you open up uh, your, your, your data? But I would like to explain a bit the concept of who owns the data. Mm -hmm. Nobody really owns the data. It's the customer's data, and everybody has their own data and their own ecosystem. Uh, there's no difference between a digital world and a physical world. When we were a small, let's say, let's say we are a small store. This is how an evolution of a company goes. Start with a small store, and then you grow up to have two stores, five stores, who owns the data of the sales data? Yeah, the customer knows, and, and the store knows. And then usually the stores evolve again. They become big. Some of my clients who were traders, they became big. They became modern retailers. 
and suddenly they start to sell their own product. So they sell other people's product and sell other, their own product. They sell to manufacture their own product. Mm -hmm. Who owns the data? It's unclear. I, I don't think it's, it's worth arguing about, but it's the same thing. So now I'm, at, I'm, I'm a bank. They have problems in, in their business because everything has to be by the second. Both Shopee, Tokopedia, Traveloka, Ticket, Blee, Blee, all these companies need to do business 24-7 by the second. And they have their clients who have clients. Who owns data? Uh, I can see payments data, but I don't know exactly other data more than that. I don't know what, what, is, uh, the, what are they buying. I don't know what's the quantity. We can guesstimate. Um, they know other, other data, but they don't know the payroll of these customers. We may know, but because uh, we, we, we have to keep it private, of course. Uh, the clients know their own data, but they don't know what's going on beyond that. Uh, again, it's, it's what Deepa was saying. It's all about ecosystem. It has always been ecosystem, even before any technology. I would, I would give the picture of forest. Forest is an ecosystem. And in a forest, you have several hundred thousand species of trees living together. And there are what we call the mother trees. So some of the mother trees may be teak, may be banyan tree, some may be a pine tree. And you know what? The forests are 90% connected. It's not the internet. The, it's www. It's the world wide wood. <laughs> world They're all connected wood. to the roots through the fungus. It's called the API. And they share resources. They share water. They share minerals. They share antibodies. And now if you look at them, let's suppose we look at our planetary system. The Earth, the Moon, Sun. We are all connected through what we call nature forces, like gravity, electromagnetism. If there is no gravity, we would be flying around unconnected all over the place. It's an API. It's all <laughs> ecosystem. <laughs> Debo, you would like to add something? Yeah, I'd just like to add, and I, and I think you said it very well, uh, but just to bring it home with a couple of examples, uh, you know, through our um, global uh, ventures arm, we've been, uh, together with the business and the ventures arm, we've been partnering with many fintechs globally. Uh, we work with, uh, I'll, I'll just talk about one or two examples which have really made sense for us. Uh, you know, you heard some of the clients on the video talk about how reconciliation is a very painful activity for them. And if anybody's been a treasurer in a company, you'll know how painful it is and how difficult is it to then uh, apply that cash and that has an actual impact on working capital. Uh, we work with a fintech uh, called High Radius globally and they have taken our clients uh, reconciliation rates from 30% to 90%. Creating significant impact. Similarly, we work with fintechs in the area of uh, uh, fraud detection through the use of artificial intelligence and machine learning, and that has helped detect a lot of fraud. Uh, we recently uh, did a fintech day where we took our actual customer problems and we threw them out to about 3,000 fintechs in ASEAN. And 70, uh, we got 70 solutions and we came down to about eight or 10, eventually one of them from Indonesia actually, uh, that really can help solve our customer problems. So there is a real, real benefit to banking uh, to, to include the fintechs Thank in you. the Thank you. Thank you, William and Debo. Let's move to, uh, to William. Tokopedia is a success story of, of the fintech. So uh, probably you can, you can talk about it. But my, my question really is, this is the new type of entrepreneurship, right? I think one of the problem of Indonesian economy is the lack of entrepreneurship, right? Even the, the current entrepreneurship, they move to the political, now, now they become politician. So how, how do you see the importance of entrepreneurship going forward in the, in the digital era and, and, and how your, your story can fit in uh, to, to, to that issue? And, and also uh, from your point of view, how, how do you have any, if, if you have any expectation 
to the financial industry, how, what, what would you like to see going forward in, in terms of digital transformation? So first about entrepreneurship in the digital era, uh, in your story of Tokopedia, and as well as your expectation to the digital transformation uh, in, in the financial industry. Please, William. Thank you, Pak Erwin, and uh, good morning, distinguished guests. Selamat pagi, Pak Gubernur, Pak Peri, dan seluruh pimpinan Bank Indonesia. Thank you for having me. Uh, so, Tokopedia this August will celebrate our 10 years anniversary. So, for Indonesia Internet Company, this consider as a very old company, a dinosaur, while uh, 10 years for general companies consider a very young company. If we can go to the next slide. So our mission is uh, actually to democratize commerce through technology. And the reasons being is because the two founders is actually come from a small city. I myself come from Pematang Siantar, a small city in North Sumatra. And until today, there is no shopping mall in my hometown. So any product that available in Jakarta, you might not find in uh, that product selection in my uh, home, home, home city. And if you find the product, you most likely will need to pay premium for that products. And my parents saved their whole life, and my uncle support that to just uh, send me to Jakarta to have a better education. And uh, unfortunately, when on my second year, when my uh, late father start to falling ill, and my mom is just a stay-at-home mom, I have a two choice either go back to my hometown or find any way to just uh, stay in Jakarta. I choose the second option because I believe and I know for sure the opportunity is bigger in a big city. So this is actually a very worrying uh, situation. This is a creating a vicious cycle. If every Indonesian need to have a better opportunity, they need to move to a big city. If every business is to expand their businesses, they need to go to a big city, then it will be a vicious cycle. So we, we start to find a solution of this, and 10 years ago, we started Tokopedia with that mission statement because we believe technology should be an infrastructure that can help connecting people to Langit. It's an infrastructure that can really connecting people and build trust, so people doesn't need to move to a big city for a better opportunity. If you go to the next slide, in the past 10 years, then we grow from two people to become 4,200 uh, team members. And every month now, we have about 90 million uh, unique visitors or unique, unique monthly active users. That represent one out of the three Indonesian customers is already, uh, one out of every three Indonesian citizens is already at least once in a month visiting or using our uh, platform. And every, every month, there's already 97% uh, uh, district, uh, there's already transaction happens in 97% district in Indonesia. And surprisingly, 65% of that is uh, delivered in the next 24 hours. Just uh, last week, I have a conversation with my friend. She has a, uh, he has a holiday in, uh, he, he spent a holiday in the uh, US for uh, two weeks. And he said to me that, uh, William, uh, Tokopedia has actually spoiled me. Because when I, in Indonesia, I buy anything from your platform that in the next 24 hours or 48 hours, I already receive my product. In US, actually, I buy a product from a big e-commerce company there, it only receives in three to four days. So actually, Indonesia with 17,000 island, we already, uh, with the ecosystem approach, we can actually uh, leapfrog and uh, providing a services that um, as good as uh, even better than a developed country. And the most important part, um, Tokopedia is not only changing the founder's life, it's actually changing millions of, and creating millions of entrepreneurs. So today we're already helping 5.5 million people to, that start and grow their business together with uh, Tokopedia. And a, a very interesting fact is 70% of them are first-time entrepreneur. Stay-at-home mom, colleague student, office worker. They are the one that actually have a dream to become entrepreneur, starting their own business. But uh, maybe because of lack of capital, lack of a network, uh, do not have uh, access to the distribution. But thanks to the technology, now everyone can start their business with uh, pretty much low barrier of entry. So most of them, these uh, uh, new entrepreneur, at first they use Tokopedia as their side job. But the moment that the income from the side job is uh, 
bigger than their um, main income, then it's become a main job and they start to creating a, um, a jobs opportunity for their surrounding area. And 5.5 million with 17% entrepreneur is a very small amount. Today, Indonesia, backbone is a small businesses. We have 60 million small businesses. If 70% of 5 million is a new entrepreneur, meaning that only 1 million out of 70, uh, 1 million out of 60 million is already transformed using online. Indonesia today is a $1 trillion economy. If like we grow to become $2 trillion economy, or eventually to $5 trillion economy, majority of that economy will come from the new economy. If you can go to the next slide. Uh, Mit Anggun uh, from Banda Aceh. So in 2004, Banda Aceh, um, it's very sad that got a tsunami and uh, a lot of people die. Anggun lost his dad and um, her mom put her in an uh, orphanage so she can continue her education. And after finished school, Anggun can start business. Um, using uh, Tokopedia. So she helped her mom that um, basically selling a local um, co coffee, local goods, uh, packaging that with the brands around that. And used to be distribution is the most expensive um, uh, and the biggest barrier of entry. It's not about creating a product or producing a product is a most likely is about how to distribute that and how to generate the sales. So now everyone across the Indonesia, La Angun, do not need to wait and build the business th uh, through a couple of generations to have a distribution nationwide. Overnight, the moment that she see the products and she repackaging it, uh, do the online marketing, see eventually have the globe, uh, the nationwide uh, distribution. If you can go to the next slide. And because of that 90 million uh, monthly active users, then Tokopedia become a larger ecosystem by itself. We start with work, work with like um, uh, um, BOMN, SOE, to actually help them connecting to our customer. So now people can pay for any utility bills and so on. And um, a lot of banks, our bank's partner is already providing a merchant's lending and uh, having a financial uh, inclusion to especially the 70% of new entrepreneurs that do not have a credit score in the offline traditional means. But uh, utilizing Tokopedia sales transaction history, then they able to access for a financial um, uh, capital access to help them grow their business to the next level. And actually, financial inclusion, including financial literacy, is a, is a big homework. A lot of Indonesian customers do not know how to um, means of saving beyond the open a bank account, for example, money market fund, and so on. So we are also working with our bank's partner. Recently, we just launched money market fund Sharia, and uh, that get a significant adoption because the barrier of entry is very low. You can actually start to open your investment account starting from 10,000 Indonesian rupiah. That is less than one dollar. You can actually saving from um, 50, 40 cents, 500 Indonesian rupiah in a form of gold. Um, and the moment that this is a partnership with Pegadaian, and the moment that um, these are uh, high school students. They have 500 Indonesian rupiah or 10,000 Indonesian rupiah. They try it. A week, a week later, they see that their amount of investment growing. They understand, oh, this is investment products. So that helps financial literacy in a more significant way. So this actually reflect the way that how traditional bank company one decade ago uh, with a brand store in a busy street and a customer comes to the brand store. But we can see in the past one decade, it, the bank start to shift the strategy from waiting from the customer coming to the brand store to building um, existency or presence to be where the customer are. Banks is uh, always 
exist in any universities in Indonesia. Banks are having ATM machine in any uh, minimart chain. Banks open a weekend banking on the malls because uh, majority of uh, employee doesn't uh, able to go to uh, bank and uh, enjoy bank services on the uh, working days. So this also happens on the online world. Um, a platform like Tokopedia that have uh, 90 million uh, monthly active users can be a very strategic partners to introduce a new uh, products and so on. And we also start to work with like local government to help on the tax adoption with a uh, recently um, and um, also helping to gather a charity from the customer so last year with the earthquake incident in Indonesia we managed to gather 1.5 million uh, US dollar uh, donations to help that's come from the millions millions of customer each of the customer only pay a very small uh, only contribute a very small amount of rupiah but combined together with a million of people then it generate uh, millions of dollars to help our uh, brothers and sister that is in in trouble can we go to the next slide at the core of tokopedia philosophy is like we believe that um, it should be ecosystem play we should building bridges not walls we believe that in order for us to be successful, we need to help others to become successful. So we are operating one of the most beautiful business model in the world. I still remember 10 years ago when Tokopedia started, me and Leon, the co-founders, we, we changed shift. He's a morning and afternoon shift, and I'm the evening and night shift. Because for our platform to work, we need to manually check the bank account every single day. So every minute we need to refresh the browser to really figure out if uh, any customer paid or not. And we do that for three years. And that one possible Tokopedia to grow to Tokopedia today without the ecosystem grow. With the banks, uh, BCA, Mandiri, BRI, Bank DKI, every bank actually innovate and open their um, uh, system, open banking system with the API is a connecting host to host. Now, for example, in the recent uh, um, Ramadan uh, sales, every minute there's a one, there's 11, on average, every minute in that one day is 11,000 uh, transaction. In one day, we generate 100 million uh, US dollar of sales. Wow. So that's not possible with like manually refresh. Um, uh, we have 4,200 people, don't, no one doing that manual uh, refresh. That only happens automatically on the seconds because of all the uh, bank innovation. And uh, early today, uh, Pyrin shared a survey about what do you feel about technology as a disruption. We at Tokopedia have a philosophy that we don't want technology to be, we don't want to see technology as any disruption. Technology shouldn't be disruption. Technology should be enable and empowerment. One of example of the form of technology is electricity. We today cannot find anyone or any, like our parents or our neighbor that say that, hey, I just lo lost my job. I just got fired or I, I just lose my business because of electricity. Because electricity as a form of technology is a form that everyone knows, everyone understand, and everyone utilize to enable and to empower them. But today, every, we, we still hear and we still listen and we still find people that fear about internet and people still consider that, hey, I just lose, I, I potentially can lose my jobs because of internet. Um, I can lose my business because of internet. I pray in the next one or two years, we will no longer uh, mention about online versus offline. Every business need to be have uh, existence in uh, online and offline. So online internet will be just like electricity, and technology will continuously change from electricity to become internet, from internet mobile to become mobile first, and then uh, there is artificial intelligence, there is virtual reality. All of this is uh, the unknown, and uh, when when technology is in the form of unknown, it scares people, and uh, that's how Tokopedia as an Indonesian tech company commit how we can actually proactively transform this uh, technology jargon into easy to use technology 
into everyone's hands so every single individual and every single business in Indonesia can understand and can use technology not to kill any businesses but to support any businesses to grow to the next level. Nice. You. So you're practicing the open APIs. The, the governor mentioned earlier that Bank Indonesia have an initiative to standardize the open API in order to boost the collaboration between banks and fintech or, or fintech and, and fintech. How do you see this initiative? Is, is it really helpful for, 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 for the collaboration if we have the standardized open API, for example? Yeah, I think one of the challenges of technology is adoption. So the moment that it has a standardization, then the education to the market, the adoption will be much, much more easier. Right? So uh, for us, we always believe that this, uh, no one can actually build and uh, help to drive Indonesia to achieve our potential uh, utilizing uh, uh, technology. This is uh, all stakeholder responsibility from the regulator uh, to public space to private uh, company. Wow, big applause to the speakers. Um, let's see. I, I don't have any question. I don't know, probably for some reason we don't have an online um, here. Only um, appreciation about the seminar and so on. So, and, and, and other than that, we only have about 10 minutes. So, uh, one or two questions from, from the audience, please. If not, do you have any question? No? It's really clear? <laughs> all right, all right. I think I don't want to summarize. This is too difficult. So, but certainly, our time is not really sufficient. But Governor already said, this is not the f last. This is the first meeting. This is the first seminar. We will have like an annual seminar like this to, to, to discuss further, probably in more technical way. Uh, I think everybody will agree. Um, every word shared by the speakers here is, is the one good reason why our second survey uh, point out that Indonesia in 2025 will be the winner in terms of digital transformation. Again, big applause to the speakers. All right, um, please. That's it. That's it. My mic is, oh, hi, again. Thank you so much, Pai Erwin, and thank you to all the speakers as well. Thank you very much. And you may all return to your seat. Excellent. And soon enough, we will begin our second discussion session. And the topic for the session is the importance of mobile fast payment in the financial digital transformation. Now we will begin this session with an overview on the topic. And of course, to deliver this overview, we would like to invite Bapak Sugeng, Deputy Governor of Bank Indonesia, also the lead speaker of this session. Now, is everything ready? Bapak Sugeng, the floor is yours. Honorable Governor of Bank Indonesia, Dr. Eri Fargio, Honorable Board of Governor of Bank Indonesia, and also I think we thank uh, for coming, Pak Olia, Pak Ronald, uh, distinguished guests and participants. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Very good morning. After Fruitful discussion of this uh, the first topic. I think so we can learn so much uh, on you know on digital economy. And now allow me to start the second section to talk about the how is the importance of the mobile payment uh, in digital transformation. 
Before talking about this on detail, uh, we have, few, we have uh, of the view that uh, it is very important to understand the importance of the payment system as a whole the econ uh, in the economy and of course in the financial uh, sector. I think the governor has already touched on in the beginning of the presentation Then actually uh, the central bank on the, on the monetary authority of that in touch in the payment system has to great interest in the area of the payment system. The first one is how to promote the efficient, sound, and of course, uh, of course, in the robust of the system. And the second is uh, uh, seeking way to minimize the system risk payment system. That uh, actually in the first discussion we know that uh, there is some of a risk. Those two of element has significant influence. The first one of the conduct of the monetary policy. Of course, this is also affecting the house in the transmission of the economy. And of course, also in the sound of the financial system. The rebirth of the system, uh, I think, is a key element how to make the stabilize in the financial system. And also, how is the functioning of the economy as a whole? I think this is, uh, uh, we have maybe have a chance how to to look at for the, the driving force for the economy for the near future. Uh, payment system are also relevant to the financial stability. The very large value they handle that creates the possibility that a failure in a system could cause broader financial and economic ins uh, instability. Payment system laying all of the participants in terms of uh, them so that it is important that they are designed and operate in a way that probability of financial difficulties and also spreading uh, from one participant to another participant is uh, very small. As we know that, actually, there is two types of transition in the payment system. As uh, we are already known that the first one is the, the whole payment system, and the second is uh, the little payment system. If we took a look uh, deeper on this transition, actually, uh, in terms of daily every transition value, the world payment system indeed serves by real time uh, gross settlement is dominated in the transition. I think maybe around 93% is uh, dominated by the RTGS. And then, in terms of daily every transition in volume, in the, in the this another side, the retail payment system, which consists of national clearing house, cut this transaction, and electric money dominate the transaction. I think this is uh, in terms of the percentage is around 99%. Uh, that is, we can see that uh, the retail payment system is a uh, very huge influence on the economy of uh, Indonesia in particular. Uh, furthermore, if we take a look more, the retail payment is used by a huge number of people. That is very, very important. Representing by huge number of the total instrument, I think it's around 183 million cut with instrument, and on, on so close to 200 million electronic money instrument. It's of this nearly close to the number of total of population of uh, Indonesian Indonesian population. Recently, the development of retail payment system was broadly boosted by technological lapse fraud, I think uh, in, the first in the first discussion, we know on, on it. In general, technological lapse fraud has in interfered both real and financial uh, sector. In the financial sector, the assimilation between innovation and uh, technology occur mostly in the area of payment system, especially retail payment on recently most people mentioned as a digital payment. With the support of technology and innovation, retail payment system will be repositioning to work with uh, this ecosystem from a discrete standalone activity into one of several integrated elements within a wider end-to-end -end customer interaction. As retail payment integrate with the wider end-to-end -end ecosystem, to serve should be meet the customer and industry expectation. 
to fulfill the need, various countries had already started their initiative to enhance their uh, payment system, the retail payment system, become real-time and uh, instant retail payment. I think there are uh, several characteristics of the modern retail payment system. That's our first one, as I already mentioned by the speaker, 24-7 and operate full years. Immediate and close immediate clearing. Also real-time crediting to pay our beneficiary and also instant notification. I think this is uh, very important for the buyer. Eh? With these characteristics, instant payment could create uh, frictionless uh, comments and enable seamless and immediate payment process. The, the initiative to develop instant payment occur in various uh, countries because it could be bring a lot of uh, benefit. Instant payment bring opportunity to the end of user, also in the payment system provider, as well as, of course, the last one is very important, is uh, society, I think. The key benefit may be arise due to the speed and service availability. Inherent instant payment, while other may result from particular feature of the instant payment implementation. We know that the benefit for the user, if we look from the user side, the benefits among other things is uh, speeding up the government payment with uh, beneficiary. I think uh, we quite know that uh, in Indonesia, in uh, social assistance, uh, speeding up is very, very important uh, for bringing the, you know, the, the fund from the central bank, uh, from the, the central government you know, to the rural people, mostly in the poor uh, society. Also, able to complete urgent payment transition at adequate speed and whenever necessary. The other one of the benefit is improving cash management, including budgeting and tracking for the MSE and, of course, for the other co cooperation. While if we take a look from the other side, that is the benefit, for, uh, uh, especially from the payment system provider, among other things is uh, looking for the timing, uh, time shift, uh, shifting in processing transaction. Also, in income generating and more value added service that we uh, needed from this uh, uh, situation. And also, casting cutting in the longer term, of course. For society, the benefit and the adoption of modern technology, rather than struggling right now uh, using uh, the, you know, the legacy system, and also catalyst for the further innovation, which bring, of course, the property and inclusiveness of the uh, activity. Now, we should be aware that, uh, I think it's also mentioned uh, before in the session before, that we have to understand that there is some, of course, uh, some risk, although some benefit is already, we, we got it, maybe. Uh, we have to aware that the emergence of the instant payment will also lead to several risks, both uh, in terms of the policy on from the operational uh, side. In the view of Bank Indonesia as payment system authority, the development of many property instant payment, which are not interconnected, create fragmentation that lead the inefficiency in the payment system. Probability instant payment system will induce several providers to become main player who have ability to master customer data, to perform oligopolistic practice, and to distort price. This should be uh, avoided, of course. Omnichannel business model provided by non-bank institutions could trigger, we call it, crowding out effect and also uh, shadow banking risk. And last, uh, regulators should provide appropriate mechanism to ensure anti-money laundering and counter-financial terrorism approach to prevent data misuse and to increase cyber resilience. Uh, meanwhile, uh, if we take a look on from the operational side, we also need to be aware that uh, 
about a credit and liquidity risk, operational risk, and also is important is a legal risk of the payment system service. We will hear a lot of about this risk from the upcoming speaker who had implemented instant payment in their country. I think we can uh, learn on, on, on this issue. The first one is on the credit and liquidity risk should be addressed with, I think, uh, we have to address with uh, appropriate clearing mechanism, uh, IT immediate clearing, and close immediate clearing. I think that is one way that uh, we have to avoid uh, the, the risk. And also to ensure the system reliability in 24-7 uh, operation, and while suffering uh, sufficient standard operation procedure to prevent operational risk, and also it is in related to the legal basis, uh, stimulate adequate legal for framework for instant payment is, uh, qua, is uh, uh, needed, as well as as far as it's very important to protect the customer. The case in Indonesia, instant payment has already actually in place. Online fund transfer near real time with almost 20 for seven availability has been introduced in Indonesia since maybe a decade ago through a service of a switching company. Currently, along with a rising number of non-bank e-money provider, customers have more option to transfer money as well as to pay in real-time experience. Yet, several improvements are still required to meet the best practice criteria of the instant payment, uh, that is including, I think, but governors already mentioned before, immediate notification, uh, cost reduction, more efficient clearing mechanism, and liquidity management to mitigate uh, risk. Based on the current condition in Indonesia, Bank Indonesia, among other things, will focus on the development of mobile fast payment as one of the key part of Indonesia payment system 2025. The main principle in developing retail payment system, including mobile fast payment, are 24 7, real time, low cost, secure, and integrated as well as interconnected. This is very important element of the fast payment system, the modern fast payment system. To ensure the fulfillment of this principle, Bank Indonesia will play a role, there is two roles actually, operational as the operator and also as the regulator. I think we still need uh, both of the uh, role for this area. If we take a look on the, uh, the op op uh, operator, Bank Indonesia will transform the national clearing system, as we call it SKNBE, into a real-time retail payment platform, which are able to serve the need of mobile, fast, and cheap transaction. And at the front end, Bank Indonesia will provide integrated channel and interconnected platform between several providers through the unification of payment interface, commonly known as a UBI. Meanwhile, as the regulator, Bank Indonesia will simplify the framework of payment system regulation to encourage payment system efficiency. Bank Indonesia will also encourage national payment gateway and PG toward the development of the uh, fast payment mobile uh, based instrument processing based on the main principle 24 7, real time, low cost, uh, secure, integrated, and interconnected, of course. Now, looking ahead, before achieving mobile fast payment as a future transformation of financial clearing system, in, in, 2000, uh, uh, in this year, Bank Indonesia will introduce the quick win milestone with its an enhanced national clearing system, faster, cheaper, and better. The enhanced national clearing system will improve several aspects of existing national uh, clearing system. The first one, faster, increase the number of clearing cycle from five to nine, or one clearing cycle per hour, so that uh, service level agreement reduces to maximum two hours. 
uh, one hours in sender and one hour in the receiver from four hours before. So this is uh, some uh, big improvement. And cheaper, of course, th around 30% cost reduction for the customer from 5,000 rupiah. No, it's, it's just only 3,500. 3, and of course, the last is better, to be better. The value capping increase from 5 million rupiah, no, it's uh, 1 billion rupiah. Furthermore, to support mobile fast payment in the front end and, uh, and channel, Bank Indonesia will also implement national QR standard. I think uh, today is already uh, opened by Pak Governor. We name it as QR Indonesia standard. Bank Indonesia in, uh, initiated the development of QR code national standard uh, since last year, actually from the collaboration pay, uh, with Payment System Industry Asso uh, Association, of course. Mm. QR code was chosen as the front end channel for mobile fast payment due to lower cost of implementation. One of the things it doesn't need uh, the EDC, right, uh, for example. Easier mechanism to achieve interconnection among different provider and more efficient transaction fee. We know that uh, we also standardize uh, the QR system, that is the international standard. We use uh, the EMV standard uh, so that it has ability to, inter uh, to interact cross border day. With this, I think we believe that uh, the, with the modern fast payment system, I think that is, I think, a uh, vital element actually to pro to uh, to induce or to uh, support the activity economy for the Indonesian Indonesia economy that's still right now uh, growing at around five percent. Maybe with the uh, you know uh, the digital economy using this kind of uh, improvement in the payment system, we we believe that the economy growth will be more than five uh, percent in the years to come. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Bapak Sugeng, for your valuable insight. And just for your information, this event is streamed live by the Communication Department of Bank Indonesia. Now, before we begin our second session, I would like to uh, invite to join me here, Bapak Punki Pewibowo, Executive Director of Payment System Policy Department of Bank Indonesia. Hello, Pak Punki. <laughs> yes. So, Pak Bungki will moderate the second session today, but before that, you have a poll, is that correct, Pak? I have, I have two questions to be asked, and it will be uh, presented here on the screen uh, in the poll. Uh, the same uh, approach that we...